So ladies and gentlemen, this is our fifth Endoswiss meeting and this is actually for us a small uh, anniversary. And as you know, therapeutic endoscopy has tremendously developed in the last years. And that's why this is uh, the right moment also to remember the people who supported therapeutic endoscopy. And one of these um, people, this is um, Don Wilson. He is the founder of Wilson Cook Company. Today, Wilson Cook Company is Cook Medical, and uh, Don has made in his life tremendous efforts in spreading out endoscopy to all over the world, and not only to spreading out endoscopy, also to help teaching doctors from the third world. So that's why we um, decided to establish the Don Wilson Lecture at our meeting, and uh, we are very honored that his widow, Minda Eddie Wilson, is with us. And uh, for me, there is no better endoscopist than Rob Hors to give the first Don Wilson lecture here in Zurich. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Stefan. Uh, this is, um, for me, a very, very special uh, honor. Uh, it's a very one that I uh, uh, that I treasure uh, being able to do. Uh, for the younger generation, uh, I, uh, I feel a little bit sad uh, because you will not uh, get the chance to personally meet uh, Don Wilson. You have to understand um, the, the environment uh, in the early 1980s. There was this convergence of, uh, of, of a great man who had a vision uh, to advance uh, therapeutic endoscopy. And that converged with a, a great need. Uh, there were brilliant people around the world who were inventing new ways to use a flexible endoscope. ERCP uh, had, had come, to, come of age. Uh, polypectomy had come of age. Um, but we needed tools. We desperately needed tools. And uh, there appeared uh, for us uh, this, this, this wonderful uh, person, uh, Don Wilson, whose vision it was to uh, equip us uh, with the instruments that we needed. And there's this uh, in incredible uh, interchange that went on with uh, Don tra and Minda uh, traveling around the world meeting with the thought leaders uh, and working out new technologies and new approaches to things. And it was just a, a, a very, very uh, exciting environment. Pictures uh, say a thousand words. Uh, unfortunately, my words are not robust uh, and, and poignant enough really to, uh, to express uh, my feelings toward Don. But these are, are representative uh, of him. I, I think I would start here in the lower left. Uh, always uh, his strength was, uh, was Minda. They were a formidable team uh, traveling around the world. Uh, but uh, this is significant because uh, he always had a smile on his face. Uh, he was someone who uh, really enjoyed what he did, and enjoyed and engaged in people. And so uh, he was always smiling, uh, and Minda and Don uh, were always uh, together. He was also a very thoughtful person. This is a, a photo that's uh, sort of important for me because he, he frequently had uh, this sweater around his shoulders. So it sort of brings him back to me uh, in, in a little bit more significant way. But he, he, he frequently would have this uh, sweater uh, wrapped around him when we would be at dinner. Uh, and we would be engaging in some sort of conversation. He would be asking uh, whether uh, we needed uh, new tools, if we had some ideas, but he was also very, very much engaged with young people and, and inquiring about education and seeking out uh, young people who wanted to learn uh, and, and, and so forth. This is um, a, a picture at our, uh, we called it the beach meeting. It was a post-DDW meeting where primarily our, our European and Asian colleagues would join. Um, and uh, this is Minda at the table. Obviously, you recognize uh, these people. This is Norm Marcon's wife. Uh, this is Guido Castamagna. This is uh, Dean Jensen and his wife. 
and we're gathered around a table. Uh, and at this meeting, uh, from the very beginning, uh, this is Peter Cotton presenting Norm Marcon uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the Don Wilson uh, Lecture Award. So this is a, a tradition that's gone on, and, and we instituted it at, at MUSC for the same reason that, uh, that Stefan uh, instituted this, to, to remember a great man who had a great influence on uh, the practice uh, of endoscopy. And I'm particularly um, gratified to Stefan uh, because Minda tells me, and, and is, this was confirmed by Stefan, that he actually never met Don. So uh, if we can uh, encourage the, this uh, generation who are at the leading edge of, of therapeutic endoscopy but do not yet, uh, did not have the chance to know Don, then I think we have a chance to perpetuate this legacy. Uh, Don uh, was, was sort of focused on two different things. One obviously was equipment, but the other legacy that I think is the strongest is, is that, that of education. Uh, he was incredibly supportive uh, in, in many, many ways, whether it was housing, whether it was travel, uh, uh, it, he was supportive as scholarships, uh, he was supportive in so many ways, either individually through Cook or through societies, uh, he contributed enormous amounts uh, of money and resources toward education. And his philosophy was that his business would grow and prosper if we were educated, if, if he could uh, uh, expand uh, the use of uh, tools in therapeutic endoscopy, that patients would, uh, would uh, do better and his business would do better. And uh, the other part of his legacy, which actually uh, no other company right now uh, has ever matched is his, uh, his, his attention to assistants and, and to nurses. And he understood the importance uh, of uh, the nursing assistant uh, in the, in the pr uh, process of these uh, therapeutic procedures. So uh, Stefan um, and uh, Minda, uh, it's, um, it's, it's very, very special for me uh, to be able to give uh, the Don Wilson lecture. He's a, a mammoth uh, of a man and, and somebody that we should now and, and continue to, to celebrate. And uh, Minda, it's nice to be with you and, and, and my wife, Chris, as well. So these are my disclosures. And uh, what I've been asked to talk about is this uh, growing interchange between, uh, in biliary drainage between, between therapeutic endoscopy and uh, ERCP. And to go backwards just a little bit, I think to understand that the trends that are happening now, you have to understand uh, history. So the first ERCP was performed in 1968 uh, by uh, William McCune, who was uh, an American surgeon. Uh, but really, it was the Japanese, uh, uh, Professor Agoshi and Oi, who really uh, developed ERCP, Agoshi working with Olympus and Oi working with uh, Machida. Uh, and in 1969, uh, they um, began doing uh, ERCP, and it was a presentation uh, actually in 1970 uh, at the uh, World Congress uh, in uh, Copenhagen, I believe, uh, where Oi presented his uh, experience with ERCP that really started uh, ERCP going. It began as an imaging procedure, as a diagnostic procedure. That's difficult for young people to understand in, in this day of ERCP, but it actually began as a diagnostic procedure. We didn't have CT scan, we didn't have MRI, et cetera, and so we would do ERCP to look for stones and to look for strictures, and then those patients would go on to surgery. And then we began encroaching on the pancreas uh, to diagnose uh, chronic pancreatitis. Now, one of my mentors and uh, somebody who I studied under and, and uh, uh, value greatly actually has this quote that in, uh, he was doing a lot of ERCPs in the early 1970s, uh, but it never occurred to me to take out stones. So this is the mindset of early ERCP. It was a diagnostic procedure, um, and uh, we never thought about the, the, the uh, possibilities of, of therapy. Well, as always occurs with, uh, with endoscopy, uh, after we get used to using it diagnostically, we think, well, what can we do therapeutically? It began with colonoscopy and then moved on to polypectomy. Well, so it began with ERCP, where instead of just diagnosing stones, uh, Kawhi and Claussen 
uh, famously uh, in 1974 sort of jointly published uh, their experience with uh, ERCP and endoscopic sphincterotomy for removal of stones. And then another great uh, in this uh, field of endoscopy, Nib Sahendra in 1979, placed the first biliary stent. And, and so began the era of therapeutic ERCP moving from diagnostic uh, to therapeutics. Well, by, uh, by 2002, we had an NIH consensus conference. Uh, by that time, CT scan was well-developed, MRI was well-developed, EUS was gaining a, a lot of momentum and was well-developed. And in fact, uh, the era of diagnostic ERCP went away. Uh, and so we no longer squirt dye to look for a bile duct stone. We diagnose that stone uh, by other means, uh, and then we take it out uh, with ERCP. So now to shift from EUS. Uh, this is uh, the first instrument that I had in 1987 uh, in Indianapolis, Indiana, at uh, Indiana University. This was the, the uh, UM3 and EUM3. Uh, you can see here, here is the, the processor, here is the, uh, uh, the monitor. Uh, the scope uh, was a, a, a 360 degree, what we call mechanical radial. Uh, the transducer was a single element transducer. Uh, that was rotated 360 degrees around the axis of the scope. This was heavy, it was bulky, uh, it was fragile. Uh, the imaging was not so good, uh, but this is what we began with uh, in, um, with endoscopic ultrasound. And the, the uh, amazing moment for us uh, back in the, in the 1980s was we could actually image the wall layers of the gut. Uh, and these, uh, Mike Kimme uh, showed very elegantly, had histologic correlates. So this was a new era for us, uh, that endoscopically and with EUS, we could actually see the wall layers uh, of the intestinal tract. And uh, with that, uh, we began uh, understanding that we could actually um, uh, uh, stage gastrointestinal cancers. So off we are now uh, with endoscopic ultrasound in the diagnosis of malignancies. Well, times have changed, uh, and in 2017, uh, when I spent uh, back then uh, much of my time staging esophageal cancer, because of these circumstances with the, uh, the fact that most people present with advanced disease, there is a, a, a great popularity for neoadjuvant therapy. Celiac lymph nodes are no longer metastatic lymph nodes, but rather they are local lymph nodes. And so much of the advantage of EUS has gone away and we've been taken over for the most part uh, by CT and PET-CT in the staging of esophageal cancer. Gastric cancer has been a little bit of an enigma. It's not very common uh, in the Western world. Uh, surgery is usually employed, and now neoadjuvant therapy is employed. So gastro, uh, the EUS has never been uh, such important uh, mechanism in uh, gastric cancer. In pancreatic cancer, we were really important. Uh, for the longest time, the portal vein uh, evaluation was of critical importance. It was invading the portal vein, and they were non-surgical uh, candidates. But uh, then, uh, pr primarily through MD Anderson, they began seeing that they could get equivalent results even with a portal vein resection. The portal vein diminished in its importance, and the arterial structures, the SMA and the celiac artery, gained in importance, and for arterial structures, which are oftentimes very, very um, uh, tortuous in their pathway, uh, CT scan uh, and MRI uh, have uh, been best at uh, showing uh, arterial involvement with pancreatic cancer. So with pancreatic cancer, our staging uh, importance, if you will, goes, goes down. And then with rectal, you heard it, uh, there is some, some uh, disagreement, uh, I think, amongst the, the ultrasonographers, uh, rectal ultrasonographers and radiologists, uh, but it's clear that the colorectal surgeons now for rectal cancer care most about the mesocolon. What is the relationship be of the rectal cancer to the mesocolon? And if you look and poll most colorectal surgeons, they feel the MRI gives them the best images of the mesocolon. And so in this area now, uh, uh, diagnostic uh, ultrasound and staging ultrasound has been diminished. 
So with this uh, situation, we have a decreasing role in cancer staging. We certainly have niche imaging in terms of submucosal masses and in the pancreas. Tissue acquisition uh, has been a very, very important driver for endoscopic ultrasound, but also it's an issue of EUS-guided therapeutics. So just as we saw, saw with uh, ERCP, as it moves from diagnostic to therapeutic, now we're seeing this transition of EUS going from a diagnostic or staging procedure to a therapeutic procedure. And this is an inevitable evolution in endoscopy. So this is a busy slide, and I apologize for that, but this uh, is a catalog of all of the uh, therapeutic, uh, EUS-guided therapeutic interventions with the, uh, it's just lacking uh, EUS-guided uh, gastro uh, jejunostomy. But you can see here it began way back in 1992 uh, with Horse Grimm uh, and describing the first uh, pancreatic fluid collection drainage and extended to 2007 with the, uh, with the description of, of uh, vascular therapy. So between 1992 and 2007, there was this slow uh, development of therapeutic uh, uh, EUS. As is apropos to this particular talk, uh, transluminal biliary drainage was actually described by Giovannini back in 2001 with uh, colidoco duodenostomy. And the procedure that you saw today uh, from uh, Mumbai uh, with Vinay Deer uh, was the biliary rendezvous procedure, again, described first by Mallory and Freeman back in 2004. So the idea of biliary drainage is not brand new. Uh, it's been described, uh, uh, but it has been a little bit slow in development. Again, 2001 and 2004. The first person to actually stick a needle uh, into the bile duct by US guidance and into the pancreatic duct as well was Moritz Wiersema. Moritz was, a, was an endosonography fellow at uh, Indiana University, a brilliant uh, endosonographer, but it was actually his first idea to get a cholangiogram in a failed ERCP uh, to diagnose what was going on. So uh, this was way ahead of his time. He published this in 1996. So we've come around now uh, to the era of therapeutic uh, EUS, and uh, it is now collided, uh, if you will, with ERCP. And what will the future bring? Uh, is EUS going to remain uh, as maybe an adjunct procedure uh, to ERCP, or is it going to replace ERCP in some circumstances uh, for this particular talk uh, in the era or the, uh, the idea of biliary drainage. So will EUS be a rescue procedure for ERCP or will, will it actually replace ERCP? Well, these are the procedures uh, that were described. I'm happy that Vinay Deer uh, did this live for us, but this is uh, the biliary rendezvous procedure, uh, accessing the bile duct uh, transgastrically, feathering a guide wire down through the ampulla and then uh, affecting um, a therapeutic intervention or biliary drainage. And then this is colidoco duodenostomy. Uh, this is a, should be for all endosonographers in the room. This is a, an apical view with a transducer in the apex of the duodenal bulb. You can see the bile duct is right there. We access the bile duct with a needle. Uh, we may dilate the tract, uh, and then we place a stent directly from uh, the duodenum uh, into the bile duct the so-called colidoco uh, duodenostomy. Which is better, uh, going into the bile duct or going uh, through the uh, liver, as uh, Vinay Deer showed today? This is a study from Mohan Kashab uh, at the Hopkins, but it was a, a prospective multi-center study comparing colidoco uh, duodenostomy, so access directly into the bile duct, or hepaticogastrostomy to perform biliary drainage. Equal number of patients, Technical success was no different. Uh, the clinical success was no different. Adverse events, although they make it look a little bit different and were higher for hepatical gastrostomy, were not statistically significantly different. The length of stay was significantly shorter for the uh, bile, direct bile duct drainage group as opposed to the uh, hepatical gastrostomy group. So a little bit of differences, but in terms of clinical success, 
the two are equal. I think most of us feel that, uh, that direct puncture into the bile duct is a bit easier and safer, even though it was not shown uh, on this particular uh, study. Well, this is a uh, prospective uh, multicenter study of EUS uh, guided biliary drainage for malignant obstructive jaundice in failed ERCP. So it, this follows a progression. Uh, we first think about ERCP, uh, EUS as a way to drain the bile duct. Then we compare a couple of different techniques to maybe see if, if one of them is better. Then the next point of evolution of a procedure is to compare it or to rescue another procedure. So if ERCP fails, it makes sense to try EUS-guided uh, biliary drainage. And this, again, is a prospective multi-center trial. Again, uh, the first author was Mohan Kashab uh, from uh, Hopkins. But basically, the technical success for accomplishing biliary drainage in malignant obstructive jaundice after a failed ERCP was 96%. The procedure time was 40 minutes. The clinical success rate was 90% in this failed group, ERCP group, and the adverse events was 10.5%, uh, four being mild, four being moderate, but one being severe, and one being fatal. The median survival of these patients was 167 days, which is not dramatically uh, different than what we would expect with ERCP. The six-month stent patency prediction was 95%, and the one-year stent patency was 86%, which is really um, uh, pretty, pretty good. So now we're beginning to maybe establish that uh, EUS-guided biliary drainage maybe is a rescue procedure for failed ERCP. The next thing to do now uh, is to compare it to what is the standard of care. So for most of us, in our career, if we failed at ERCP in malignant obstructive jaundice, we would go to PTC. So now it was time to compare the results of EUS-guided uh, biliary drainage versus PTC. And you can see here, this is not a randomized trial, uh, again, coming from Mohan Kashab uh, and his group, uh, but it was a, a, a multi-center uh, study. You can see here that um, in, in terms of uh, mean uh, bilirubin, uh, mean post uh, bilirubin uh, was significantly different. The technical success rate was significantly better for uh, percutaneous drainage, but the clinical success rate, a more important parameter, there was no difference between PTC and EUS guided drainage. There were some other important differences, however, if you looked at um, adverse events, it was significantly lower for EUS guided biliary drainage than it was for PTC. If you looked at need uh, for re-intervention, uh, it was significantly lower, 15.7% uh, for the um, uh, EUS group and 80% uh, for the percutaneous group. And then this is a, a long slide of multiple things, but the bottom line here is that the cost of EUS guided uh, biliary drainage uh, was significantly lower than it was for percutaneous. So clinical success equivalent, but uh, adverse events uh, was significantly less. The need for reintervention was significantly less, and the cost was significantly less for EUS guided. So now maybe uh, EUS guided biliary drainage is advancing a little bit further. It's now maybe a good rescue for ERCP, and maybe it is now as good or better in some uh, respects than the standard of care, which is uh, percutaneous. This is a meta-analysis. We're in love with meta-analysis nowadays, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, they selected 16 uh, uh, publications out of uh, 846. The number of patients in this group was 528. But again, if you looked at a meta-analysis of EUS guided biliary drainage, the clinical success is, about, is in the early 90s, about 91%. The complication rate is about 16%. Uh, and when compared to the pool data comparing, uh, it, comparing it with percutaneous biliary drainage in this, uh, this meta-analysis, EUS guided biliary drainage was more successful with fewer complications. 
So now direct studies and uh, now meta-analysis suggesting that maybe EUS uh, is better. So I think at this point in time, uh, we can summarize in saying that at least in expert hands, EUS-guided biliary drainage is equivalent uh, to percutaneous biliary drainage with the added advantage not only of cost, fewer reinterventions, et cetera, but now for us as gastroenterologists uh, and perhaps as some surgeons, since we're seeing the patient, presumably for ERCP, if we fail, instead of waking the patient up, sending them down to interventional radiology and getting a, a percutaneous study, now we can go forward with EUS-guided uh, drainage as one uh, procedure. And I think EUS-guided biliary drainage appears to be a good alternative when ERCP fails. So are we at a point now where EUS-guided biliary drainage in malignant obstructive jaundice should perhaps uh, replace ERCP? Um, this is the question. So uh, this was a study that we did uh, at the Florida Hospital in Orlando. We were seeing these publications of failed ERCPs at really very, very good centers. And we couldn't understand this because we weren't seeing the same number of cases uh, for, uh, for EUS-guided biliary drainage for failed ERCPs as our colleagues were around the world. So we did a, a prospective study, uh, 1,000 consecutive patients uh, undergoing ERCP at Florida Hospital. And uh, out of this 1,000 uh, patients, 524 had a native papilla, so uh, they had not had any prior intervention. And out of this group, we could reach the ampulla in 99% of patients. So we could at least get to the papilla in 99% of those patients. And uh, using standard cannulation techniques, we were successful in accomplishing the task in 87% uh, percent uh, of these cases. In the other 13%, uh, uh, we went to advanced cannulation techniques, guide wire in the pancreas, a stent in the pancreas with an access sphincterotomy, fistulotomy, uh, pre-cut sphincterotomy uh, uh, in some cases, but these are what we categorize as advanced techniques. And we were successful in 64 out of these 67 uh, patients who had failed a standard cannulation technique, indicating that we had successful biliary cannulation in 98.3% of, of, of patients uh, using either standard or advanced techniques. Then we looked at a, a, a subgroup of patients who had failed outside ERCPs, thinking, well, if they failed outside, maybe that's the group where we're going to end up doing a lot of EUS guided biliary drainage. But in fact, 80% uh, uh, of the time, we were able to get a cannulation in these failed ERCPs with a standard technique, and uh, we used advanced techniques in about 20%. Bottom line is that 100% of these failed ERCPs, we were able uh, to get in. So uh, is there really a need uh, for EUS guided biliary drainage if, in fact, with good ERCP technique, we can get in? Well, this is a, a, a video from, uh, from uh, actually given to me by Alberto Larghi, and I don't have the, the mechanism uh, here of starting that video. Can, can you start the video from the back? Thank you. So this is the bile duct. Uh, this is using the hot axios. There's a direct puncture into the bile duct. This is a patient with a failed ERCP. There's a deployment of the uh, proximal or the biliary phalange. He pulls back, uh, and then he deploys the distal phalange. And then you'll see here in just a moment, um, you'll see successful biliary drainage. There's the, the duodenal phalange. And, and this procedure uh, was uncut and took two minutes. Okay, so it took two minutes. To, um, uh, to achieve biliary drainage in this patient with ampullary cancer and a failed ERCP. So uh, in my mind, I'm thinking, if you've got really good ERCP technique, maybe you don't need it very often, only in cases where you can't access the papilla, et cetera. But after seeing this, uh, as a teacher, I begin to think, well, 
let me see, I've been, we've been at ERCP in our group, we've, been, we've got an average of about uh, 15 years of ERCP experience. We'll sometimes rescue each other uh, if we need to. And so um, it, there's a lot of experience, a lot of training that has gone in to our achieving uh, this 98.3% cannulation rate. And if I think about uh, the future generations uh, of endoscopists, is it easier to teach somebody to do 98.3% cannulation with standard techniques and with advanced techniques, or is it easier to take a student and teach them EUS guide to biliary drainage? So this is the question that I think will drive um, sort of the future of uh, biliary drainage. We do not have all the questions. We don't have long-term um, uh, answers uh, to EUS guided biliary drainage. Uh, we're just beginning now to get patients undergoing uh, EUS guided biliary drainage who are then going to surgery, and maybe EUS guided biliary drainage makes surgery impossible in the future. We just don't know. But we're uh, now at, at my institution, we're in the midst of a randomized trial uh, to try to answer the question of whether you should go to ERCP or whether you should go to EUS guided uh, biliary drainage. So my final slide is just the future considerations. Uh, will it be easier to train the next generation of endoscopists to do EUS guided biliary drainage and malignant obstructive jaundice versus ERCP? Can EUS guided biliary drainage be made safer than ERCP? Can we cut down on the, um, on the risks? Will EUS guided biliary drainage lower costs and improve outcomes. So that's the mantra in the United States right now, lower costs and improve outcomes. Will it do that? We don't know yet. Can EUS guided biliary drainage be done without the need for x-ray? This is something that's going through people's minds in areas of the world where getting good fluoroscopy is not possible. Is it possible that you can do this completely under EUS guidance and obviate the need for uh, x-ray? That would be uh, important perhaps in some areas. And will EUS guided biliary drainage be safer for patients with altered anatomy than it is with long uh, balloon uh, assisted scopes, et cetera? So I think that the answers are not there. Uh, for me, it's been great to see this evolution uh, toward therapeutic ERCP. We now need to do the proper randomized trials uh, so that we can really definitively tell our patients which is the best approach uh, for them. But I think undoubtedly EUS guided biliary drainage will begin to be done more and more uh, as long as the answers to uh, the current questions are answered uh, acceptably so. So with that, I'll, I'll close. Um, I want to thank Stefan again uh, very, very much. I want to give a, a big hug uh, to Minda uh, for, for being here. Uh, it's really a great honor uh, to present the first uh, Don Wilson lecture. Um, at uh, Stefan Zivall's course. So thank you very much. Thank you.